If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Vince Del Monte has been a, he was a big presence on internet, fitness, sales, marketing. One of the OGs. He's been around the block. For a long time. Like back when YouTube was small, he was one of the first ones and built a fitness empire on it and made some en- enemies on the way, along the way. I, I guess, you know, some people said he, you know, he's, he's one of those, those, those marketers, those online marketers. He was up there with, uh, what's his name? Ching of the yeah, six pack abs, you know, abs and all these other people. But since then he's, he's tried to reinvent himself to, uh, tackle the fitness industry in a, in a bit of a different way. He's a very interesting individual. I didn't know a lot about him. Uh, except for the guy was like a fitness internet marketer uh, early on. Now you see he starts a podcast. He's you know doing all these social media posts. He talks a lot about his faith and his family. Mm-hmm. Seems like an interesting individual. So we scheduled an interview with him, and we had a great conversation. Uh, smart dude. Um, you know he's, he says a lot of the right things. He we talks went all over the faith. place. Too. All over the place. Yeah, it wasn't just fitness talk. We got into like uh, parenting and just. Oh, yeah. Self awareness. We went all over the place with him. Really good guy, man. I, I think uh, I, I really like him. We hit, we hit it off, and uh, I think it would be somebody that we connect with later on again too. Absolutely. So Vince Del Monte, you can find him on YouTube just by looking up his name, Vince, and then Del Monte D L M O N T E. His Instagram is at Vince Del Monte, and his website is Vince Del Monte Fitness dot com. Um, also, don't forget to check out the show notes. Uh, at the end of all of our podcasts. I'm glad uh, you brought that up because I get inboxes daily about people wanting like certain things that we talked about in the episode. And the mm. easiest ways to find that, you guys, is just yeah. going directly to the show notes. There'll be direct links for just about anything that we talk about on the show. That's right. And uh, that's at mindpumpmedia.com. Also, check out our fitness programs, MAPS. If you're new listening to Mind Pump, our MAPS programs are designed for different types of of muscle adaptation, a.k.a. different types of results. So we have MAPS Anabolic, which is excellent for overall muscle size and strength. We have MAPS Performance, which is excellent for functional movement ability or what I, what I like to call full-spectrum athletic performance. We also have MAPS Aesthetic, which is for your more bodybuilder or bikini competitor types. MAPS Anywhere for people who want to work out at home. And then we have correctional programs as well, That'll help you with muscle imbalances and pain and just overall movement. And we have bundles that put them together. For more information on any of our MAPS programs or nutrition programs, we also have the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. Just go to mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are talking to Vince Del Monte. Our audience, what's cool about having someone like you in here, because you don't just, you're like us where you don't just discuss fitness. You share a lot of the entrepreneurship side. So we have a very large audience of, you know, aspiring personal trainers or people that just are in entrepreneurship that love to hear stuff like that. So I always love hearing a guy like you who's been successful and some of the things that are are working well with you. So kind of share what you, the the big save, you said it was a a saved your business in the last couple of years, the transition that you made and what you do. What was that? What'd you call it? Yeah. When you said it saved your, what do you mean by saved your business? Did you notice a decline and you had to change? Yeah. You had to pull a plateau and you had to pivot or change things. I was attracting attention for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, I started making those controversial videos, the stupid vegan game kind of videos where mm-hmm. you're taking a baseball bat to stuff. And yeah, everyone will watch a baseball bat taken, being taken to a Mercedes Benz, but who's watching? Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not people are going to sign up for Nobody's a, a transformation yeah. program. Right. So yeah. you're getting views, but so I lost, uh, I lost sight of the vision. You know, I was f- wrapping my identity around my numbers. Mm. You know, clicks are down. Shoot, how do we get the clicks back up? Okay, we got to start up in the clickbait. Okay, you know, so lost focus, lack of quality control. So, um, you know, having a brother who's not a marketer, you know, he's a filmmaker. He's a creative guy. He he's looking at. You know, he's the kind of guy that'll spend two years making a film, which he just did. You know, he'll wait for the story to unfold, which is what good movie tellers do like you know f- opposed to reality tv they throw people i mean they throw people in a room they just give them a lot of alcohol <laughs> <laughs> yeah or, or, or they put them in a house where they have nothing else to do but to think about the guy so of course there's going to be controversy yeah so it's all of course it's going to be a good sh- you know fake story it'll be a story would be enhanced so he's a kind of guy that looks at work from a standpoint of like 
will this stand the test of time? Like, will this series still be good in five years from now? Mm-hmm. Like, are people going to be watching my talking head videos in five, 10 years from now? Mm-hmm. So he said, like, why don't you put some thought into what you're creating? Like you're creating these videos, but you're just like, you keep pumping them up, pumping them up. Like, why don't you slow the pace down? Why don't you do one video a week? I'm like, one video a week because, you know, Elliot Hulse does one a day and he's, his subscriber count went from like, you know, a million to two million or, you know, he blew his account up by doing it like that. Mm-hmm. And, but then, yeah, but then you get burned out. So, and that's what was happening to me. I was getting burned out. I was starting to contradict myself and uh, the quality just goes down. So now, since making making that switch, do you, have you seen a change now in your numbers? And yes, conversions? it's been positive. I, I've rebuilt my brand. Well, I've rebuilt wow. my my name. You know, I've been able now to embrace Vince as you know. For, for, if you don't, I don't know if you guys really know like my whole story, but I, you know, I started off as a fitness expert, but I also got really good at fitness marketing. So I developed a reputation. You know, between 2010 2013. Yeah, you've like, been doing this for a long time. Yeah, you know, you know, and, Vince and, is good at fitness. Ex- is, his information is good with fitness, but he's really good at fitness marketing. So I was seen as a fitness marketer first, fitness expert second, and it took two years to put back on my fitness expert hat and to come in, but. I I needed a series that kind of set me up as a real fitness expert. So we launched Muscle Camp and Muscle Camp was where guys came into my home and I trained them. And we had guys travel in, fly in, drive overnight to arrive in the morning time to do three workouts in one day. And that was the theme, three workouts in one day. And I take anywhere from four to 12 guys through these three different training uh, workouts. And we turned each workout into a YouTube video. So now I don't have to say, hey, people come and learn from me. People get to see that. And now I'm coaching them the same way I would coach you know, in a one-on-one setting. So now people are getting to see me in a different light. And I was able to actually talk normal as opposed to the way I talk when the camera... Okay, guys, today we're going to learn three tips on how to build your biceps. And the first tip, you know, I got rid of that voice and I went into just my normal voice. And people are like, oh, Vince actually is a pretty cool guy. And I put my fitness expert back hat on, but I needed like a show, a certain kind of platform to do that. And, and my brother really helped me with what that. What was the response? What were people saying to you when you first did? Because I, I think- want to come to muscle camp. Oh, cool. How do I come to muscle camp? Like it was legit. We went to Las Vegas. We did them in the big gyms with all the pro bodybuilders. You know, we've done them in powerhouse gym. We've taken over the gym. You got all these pro bodybuilders and all these dudes, uh, pro athletes working out. And I got my guys running around doing three workouts in one day with the film crew and me coaching them. And they're like, who are these guys? Oh, wow. You know, like we're not attracting pro bodybuilders. Like these guys are, you know, natural guys. So, you know, it's not like you know, people are come. it's, it's real. And so what the show was all based around was showing what it takes to get real results with real people. And, um, yeah, people loved it. And people just simply said, when are you coming to my town? Mm-hmm. Um, how much is it to show? I mean, I didn't even charge for it mm-hmm. because it was, it was, you know, people could just show up because I turned it into content. That was the value exchange. And, uh, People love muscle camp. Now, Vince, you said you you competed. So did you did you stay natural even when you're competing, or were yes. you? Oh, so you've been natural. Are you lifetime natty? Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Sometimes yeah, you on. can't tell, believe it or not. But and, and now I, you've been doing this for a long time. You've been on YouTube for a long time. I, in the beginning of when people were getting on YouTube, you were one of the first fitness. 2008. Yeah, because yeah, I remember that. I remember. I know you because you know when I'm all when I was on YouTube back in the day, you were one of the only. It was like you and Mike Chang, and you know he's a six pack guy. Yeah, Elliot Holmes goes back there. Yeah, he far. goes back there too. We got started at the same time. Jeff Cavalier was the guy who was just getting going uh, a little before me. Our kid named Arnell Rica Franco who disappeared, and uh, yeah, we didn't really know. No one was. Everyone was kind of just doing their own thing back mm-hmm. then. You know, if you watch my first ten YouTube videos, they're all shot with a hundred and fifty dollar flip cam in a gym talking head. And that's when it was like, just like put out anything. And I mean, looking back, it wasn't horrible. It was fine content. It definitely wasn't like really, it was just like seeing an opportunity to start educating people and, uh, you know, people gravitated towards it. And did you go into it? Like, this is a business I'm going to do or was it? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'd already started my online business. Yeah. So I started my online business in 2006. Oh, okay. I hired a coach in 2005. It was a six month coaching program. And, um, I launched my first ebook, No Nonsense Muscle Building in 2006. Mm. And prior to that, I was a trainer. So I was a trainer for uh, since I got out of university, which was uh, age of 22. And I was uh, working as a trainer, selling gym memberships, um, selling personal training. Mm. So I wore all hats in the gym. And then I discovered this opportunity with the internet mm. back then. You mentioned Craig Ballantyne. Was he... Uh you know, instrumental in your whole like fitness marketing 
Huge. So he was one of the first fitness guys uh, who offered a seminar. And this was back in 2000. And um, I think it was 2007 or 2008 in West Palm, Florida. It was a $2,000 event. And this was when I was just getting going. And when he announced it, I was like, I need to go. I I have to go to this event. And uh, I went to that event and there was 50 guys there and he pretty much taught his whole insist- his whole system. And that's where I started meeting a lot of guys who are, you know, doing this at a pretty big so level. So you, you had 22 years old. This is when you were 22, you're saying? Mm-hmm. You took money and bought and invested in this thing? No, I didn't hire a coach until 2005. Mm. 2005. So I was just, I got into the fitness industry just as a career. How were you doing as a trainer? Were you good? Were you, were you a good salesman? I mean, obviously if you're probably a good marketer, I would assume that you probably were good at sales. That's where I learned how to sell. Yeah. You know, when I was, um, I I started off as a trainer. When did you know, to give me a story. I want to hear a story because I, if you are a sales guy, I'm sure you have the, when, when did you get that itch or was, what was the first? I'll tell you. So I had a guy in my office, he was a lawyer and, um, he needed a full year of training, 144 sessions, you know, so we have our, you know, different tiers, $40 for 30, you know, uh, 36 sessions and above $45 for 24 sessions, $50 for 12 sessions. So, you know, I, I pretty much offered him an opportunity to, I said, this is where you are. This is where you want to go. It's going to take more than 12 months to get there. It's going to be, I recommend you working with a trainer three times per week. It's going to be over 144 sessions. And, uh, you know, he's, you know, he's a lawyer and he, you know, I knew, like I said, he started balking at the price. I knew he had money. Yeah. It wasn't money. I knew he had money. So I, I asked him like, you know, you don't mind me asking like h- how much, like, like just roughly like you make an hour and he was like something around seven, eight hundred dollars an hour. I'm like, okay, so, you know, so how many hours a week do you work? And I, we started pumping out the math of like what his time was worth to him. And, you know, over an eight hour day, over five a day a week work schedule and over four weeks, and do the math, it's quite a bit of money. And then uh, I asked him, so if you're coming to the gym three hours a week, what's that going to cost you if you're not getting results? He said, oh, that's a good one, son. This is a good one. And, and he signed up. And I'm like, so I went down and showed my boss my first 144 uh, sessions paid in full. Which those that don't know, back, and, that's a big deal yeah, back then to sell more. And more than- then he brought his wife in the next day and she bought 144 sessions too. Oh, so it was a wow. $15,000 contract. And you know, I was working on straight commission back then. My boss, um, he um, you know, recognized an opportunity with me. He, he pretty much figured out like, I got this guy isn't going to be here forever. Uh, for all the bosses listening, that's a great tip because he was like, I got to get the most out of this guy while he's here. So uh, he said, hey, Vince, you know, why don't we take you off the base and let's put you on straight commission. And it was an escalating pay, pay structure. So, um, you know, it's like 5%, 8%. 13%, 15%, 20%. So the more I sold, the more I made. Sure. So the way he coached me was like, if I had a bad month, it wasn't him coming into the room, flipping the desk. It was Vince, I don't think you're going to buy that, be able to buy that car. You said you wanted to buy next month. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he just put it back on me. And, it, you know, we weren't talking about, you know, the whole concept of extreme ownership back then, but that's pretty much what he was teaching me. Wow. What was your biggest month in sales as a trainer? Do you remember? Oh, we were over a hundred thousand dollars. You know, um, yeah, and this was like fifteen trainers. Uh, That's but, pretty damn good, especially. But, but for we them, yeah. we started. I started getting into consulting, helping other clubs. You know, big clubs. Uh, one of them was um, what the heck they're called. Um, they changed their name, the Athletic Club. Yeah, the, the Athletic Club, and we went in. Was this all up in Canada? This is all up in Canada. Yeah, they're in Guelph, Ontario, and we went in and we helped them. They weren't even doing like. 100k a month and we helped them get over 400k a month in personal Whoa. training sales. And this is a mega gym like they had like Obviously that's a huge tons gym. and tons of trainers but they weren't making any money. So I just fell in love with this world of selling. Mm. I love the idea of being able to write my own paycheck. And yeah, those were in the days between the age of um 23 to 26. Those were the years where I was was there, was there somebody in the gym that really mentored you that yeah. that pushed you and stretched you as a salesman? Do you Jeff remember? Russo and Murray Middlemost? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what are some of the things that you remember that were like, man, game changers? That like, man, this guy really helped me put that together. The first thing Jeff taught me was when he came in to consult for us. He said, "Your word is your bond." I never, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. My father's a pastor, and I'd heard that message growing up. But like when he came in, and he was like a really successful guy, well dressed, good looking guy, like well built and he had the whole package and a beautiful uh, wife and all that. And I was, uh, he just came in and he led with that. And, and, and I, I felt really convicted because I'm, I'm not always on time. I'm actually pretty bad. And he, and I was always late. 
And uh, to this day, I struggle with being on time. It's like, it's really bad. It's your Achilles heel. <laughs> It's really bad. Yeah. And, and I, I'm like, my gosh, what's wrong with me? And it goes back to selfishness. You know, my wife would say that right now. If she was here. She's like, Vince, you know, you care about yourself and, uh, <laughs> you know, you love us, but you know, it's, it's Vince number one. And, and I'm working on that obviously, but, um, yeah, I said, your word is your bond. And if you can't show up on time for work, if I can't count on you to show up on time for work, like what can I count? What, what, if you can't keep your word, what I can't, what can count I count on? Right? What, yeah. And I, and I never heard that spoken from like a man that I looked up to, like of that kind of caliber that wasn't my father. And, and, uh, it just hit me. So that was one of the first things, like if people can't trust my word, what can they trust? Right. Well, any, uh, any bad practice? Cause I know when coming up through sales, you know, and especially being young and being driven, mm. There's a lot of potential shortcuts. There's a lot of things you can say or do or, or tactics you can use that may not be mm. uh, the absolute best. Were, were there, were there mm. any shortcomings that you had early on that you had to learn your lesson from? Definitely talked, to way, w- talked way too much. Mm. Um, I, got, I, I wasn't listening to Grant Cardone back then, so I didn't know how to overcome the closes. So when people would come on and say, Vince, you're starting to pressure me. (laughs) I wouldn't know how to reply with a Grant Cardone reply like, uh, Hey, don't confuse my persistence with pressure. (laughs) (laughs) It would be like, Oh yeah, you got me there. And they'd be like, "Uh, this is getting really, really awkward. I still remember a lady saying that and says, all right, Mr. Salesman, you're not getting my money today. And, uh, you just blow people out of the water. I would just like, I, I remember some really awkward back and forths where it was like, I was just like, oh my God, they got me. And, <laughs> and I was just, my head was radiating on fire. But um, I definitely didn't give up. I definitely knew how to, you know, I, I, one of the questions I was taught was to find out if you're not committed on a scale one to 10, um, then what would make you a 10? And I would push people to get up to a 10 by typically identifying the pain that they would con- con- continue to experience. Sometimes it worked easily. Sometimes it was just like, yeah, this isn't, yeah, should have given up. But Well, that's what we talked when you interviewed us. That was a lot of what we were taught was to find the pain, right? Find mm-hmm. the insecurity and that's the hot button. That was the mm-hmm. hot button was, okay, I know this, this lady that's sitting in front of me. I know sure she wants to lose weight. She's told me that already, but there's something deeper. And if I, as a salesman, if I could go deeper into that, figure that out, poke at that a little bit, then I knew that I could set myself up for this huge sale. Did that for many, many years before I realized that I really wasn't helping that much when I realized like, man, I'm not, but that, a lot of that was just being young and naive. Like I didn't know better. I thought I thought I was doing my job. I thought mm-hmm. I'm getting them involved in training. They're better off training with me than not doing anything at all. But really what I was doing, I was just, I was just throwing them in this vicious cycle of on and off the wagon and they were never really, uh, they were never really addressing the root cause of what, Mm. why they were battling all this weight. So it took me a long time before I pieced that together. Did you ever kind of reflect on that too? Because being a good sales guy, uh, sometimes it's really easy to be kind of numb to all that and to be chasing the success of being good at sales and, yeah. and growing that way. Uh, in, in January, I was the guy that was in the office for eight hours a day and the guys would just be like putting coffee cups at the door so I could just stay in the office and close. You know, okay, guys. And, and I filled the trainers up. You know, I, I, I brought one department from three trainers to 15 trainers. So I became the guy that was writing, I was writing the trainers paychecks yeah. and I loved it. So you know, then there was new problems, obviously, because I was like, hey, if I I got to keep bringing on good trainers so that whoever I'm handing them off to, that was probably the one thing that I was, that was probably the most challenging thing, knowing we were bringing on trainers at a, at a certain rate that the trainer, I, w- I was promising something this trainer might not be able to deliver mm-hmm. on. I definitely knew that they would be better with the trainer than not with the trainer. You know, obviously for the most part, I wasn't able to monitor everything, but that was probably like one of the maybe most challenging things with selling somebody else. Cause at, by the end of the hour, they're like, so you're going to be my trainer. I'm like, no, 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 I don't take clients. You're <laughs> going to be working with so-and-so. Oh, oh. Um, so you kind of figure that I'm like, okay, is this trainer going to be able to fulfill on the promise I just made for this client? And, and yeah, sure. You miss the mark. You swing, you, sw- you know, strike out a few times, but for the most part, I felt really good about I truly believe, like, I truly believe that these people needed a trainer. Sure, right? sure, mm-hmm. sure. And mm-hmm. it would you, be better with one than without one. You said you were, your, your dad, your father was a pastor and you've, you've referenced your, your faith quite a, quite a few times. Did you ever do anything in those early days that conflicted with your, 
with the character that you either were developing or maybe was, you know, present in your household? Oh man, <laughs> you should get my dad on here now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I used to steal. I used to I used to uh, work like at a, literally. Yeah, I used to steal money from a bingo hall. Oh wow! And, and because from a bingo hall? I, from yeah, from old ass oh, people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was, oh, you shit. know, this is in high school when I was in track and field. Pastor son, man, go you get, oh, right I, I got more for you. The, the PK is <laughs> what not, they call, right? That's how the much PK time syndrome. do we have here? So yeah. I, um, yeah, my dad called me and said, where'd you get all this money? And, you know, cause you're wearing these little uh, sacks where you're going around, you know, people are buying their cards and stuff. So I'm like for hours at a time, got all this money in my pocket. And one night it just dawned on me, I could take some home and uh, I had to return <laughs> it to my track coach, a guy that I respected a lot. And, How'd you get caught? I can't remember to be honest, but I do remember getting caught and bringing it back to my dad or bringing it back to my coach. Did your dad make you do that? Yes. He okay. drove me to his house. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, my parents, so I grew up in a very uh, religious or a strong Christian home. And I remember I was part of a group of guys that went out. They were all seniors. We were freshmen. My buddy had an older brother and we all piled into this suburban and we took off at midnight, it was midnight to two in our small town. And we thought, it, well, not we, we were the young guys in the back just enjoying the ride. The seniors thought it would be funny if we drove around and we shot people with paintball guns that were walking <laughs> at 12 o'clock at night. And it was hilarious. And we all went. And uh, one of the houses that we visited happened to be somebody who also went to my church and recognized me in the back of the car. So I got busted for it. My parents made me go to all the houses that got that called because a lot of people called in the cops that night, somebody's driving around and shooting people and some like of that. So I had to go and apologize to all these people. Meanwhile, I was just a kid in the yeah. backseat. Well, you know, interesting that, you know, brought, it brought up my faith. Well, you know, I would say my parents did a really good job protecting me from the world. Like in university, when my buddies were coming out after, you know, bragging about sleeping with 100, 200 girls in the course of four years, um, I think I lost my virginity in university. Oh wow! Yeah, and you know, I and I was actually a really good guy through university. I was actually like witnessing to my friends about why they shouldn't have sex before marriage. I was that guy. I was living in a room. Uh, I was in a house with eight dudes, and um, I was the guy. Right, getting but they in, loved you. I was getting in. Oh yeah, we were getting <laughs> debates. But of course, we loved each other. Here comes cock block Vince again. You know, you, know, you know what? It was never. It never got to the point. Like to this day, we would have like a fun conversation about it. It was definitely heated. It was definitely intense. But it was there was never ever like. A dislike. It was just like yeah. we were we were both all shouting at each other, and um, I came out of university pretty good shape. I was a runner, so I didn't you know go off the deep end. Running kept me kept me focused, and uh, you know it wasn't until I started making a name for myself in the fitness industry and making some money, and uh, that I realized like I had never lived on my own, and I was living on my own in my mid twenties, and that's when um, I told my parents. I said, "This Christian faith, I'm done with it." Mm. I said, it, I, I I don't feel good about being Saturday night Vince and then Sunday morning Vince. And I was going to church Sunday morning with the family, them having no idea what had happened the previous night, Sunday night, Saturday night. And at this point you're, you're, you're having I mean, sex with girls and doing all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you yeah, know, yeah. you know, I was living the life, right. Yeah, you know, yeah. I was making money. My buddies were the guys who were telling the girls that my friend here, he lives in his own house and uh, he's got the bottles tonight. And you know, I was having fun. And uh, and I told them, I said, I can't handle the pressure of living up to this Christian faith. Mm. So um, I just wanted to let them know that I'm going to be doing my own thing. And not like that I did anything. I've never done like drugs. I've never- Really? Ne You've never done any, any marijuana, nothing? Not once in my life. Really? Just alcohol? Mm. Alcohol, yes. Just alcohol. Alcohol, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. But never, I, I don't even- You're missing out. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I'm, At this point, I'm like- Nah, it's, 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 you're not missing out. Yeah, so wink, I'm like- wink. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's again, I don't judge or anything. It's just like, it's, it's just not even an interest. Yeah. It's not something to even think so about. So you didn't go nuts. Like, you weren't like, hey, no. mom, dad, I don't want to go to church anymore. And then the next day, crystal meth with hookers. Yeah. No, like that. no, it wasn't yeah. that extreme, but it was like, you know, going to, you know, going to Vegas a little more frequently, you know, taking trips, you know, the bottles, you know, late nights, uh, just, you know, chasing the woman and just kind of getting that all out. Of, here, here's the, the interesting thing is my excuse was that I need to get this all out of my system. But everybody knows that there's no such thing as getting something out of your system. You're actually just putting it in your mm -hmm. system. And I quickly realized now that I created all these habits and I was becoming this person that I that I wasn't I didn't want to be, but I couldn't just like unravel one week going out with five girls and then the next week not going out with any. And uh, 
you know, by the grace of God, I met my, my, my wife now, you know, in my late twenties. And, um, she kind of gave me, you know, a second chance. And, and when we met, she essentially didn't want to know anything about my past. And that's how I knew she was the one because, um, I never met a girl who had enough courage, uh, who was brave enough to want to get to know me just based on how she got to know me and didn't want to start finding out about all this stuff from my past. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I never met a girl with this kind of confidence. She saw something in me that she knew was there and that I knew wanted to come out. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to drop that ball. Does she ever do anything that kind of blew your mind? I have a girl like this. And that was something that was a a very similar story. I have that, you know, Katrina and I've been together for seven years Uh and she just, I never met a woman that was comfortable with that. She doesn't ask me about my past like that. I can talk about my past and she's fine with it. Was there something, a moment that you had in your relationship where you're like, oh shit, most girls would have been crazy or would act it up a certain way. Did she do something like that that you saw and you're like, whoa, that blew my mind. She's the one. At the start, it was just really focused on us. She just wanted to get to know me. Uh, she wanted to see if there was substance there without bringing back drama that had nothing to do with us. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it was always about focusing more on the future. And um, we both had the same faith in God, same um, love for our family. She comes from a big family, 17 kids. Oh, wow. wow. One of 17. 17 kids. Was she Mormon? Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. She's a uh, Christian, Romanian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was just, uh, and I also another big thing was like, she didn't know what I did for five months. We got engaged after six months mm-hmm. and my brother actually told her she said uh no <laughs> we were actually here in florida at um over um oh where was it um jackson's and we're having dinner and we'd been dating for five months and and she thought it was a train like i told her i'm a trainer i got this biz- online business but she didn't know any financials i never told her anything about that and that was like one of the big things like she i knew that she was getting to know me mm-hmm Cause I was like my identity right. and, and she was like trying to like allow me to find like, I'm, that's cool. Vince, don't get me wrong. She, you know, she'd say to this day, it's def- I'd rather be with someone who's, you know, motivated and ambitious than someone who's not. But um, she was more, mo- she was most interested in who I was as a person, which was what I wanted to really come out and share with the world, which is what I feel like I'm sharing now, like almost 10 years later, like who the real Vince is more than just a fitness guy, more than just an entrepreneur, but someone who values family and all this other stuff. So, um, did you guys, when you guys met and talked about all these, did you start finding your faith again? Were you guys like, Hey, I know we like each other. We're going to yeah. wait till we're married no, now to we, have sex. You know, unfortunately we didn't do that, mm. you know? And, and we, um, uh, we definitely, it's hard, man. When yeah, you like somebody, it's really tough. And you want to meet, and you know, <laughs> yeah. So we, um, it's true. You know, we, we, I think to be honest, like our faith has always so been there, but it took so. over seven years for it. Like this has been our best year of marriage just this past, seven, this past year. Seven. You got three, you got three kids. Third's on the way. Third oh, on the way. Oh yeah. Did, is she the one to call you on your shit? Yes. There so give me, give me something that she's recently, Katrina loves to call me on my shit. What's oh, the last, dude. what's the last thing she called you on your shit? Yeah, man. I'll tell you straight up. Um, so, you know, I have work hours. She's very flexible. She lets me, I wake up at five 30 and, um, I work, work out, do my Instagram, do all my social media in the morning from 5.30. I've got to be home for 8 to help out with the kids between 8 and 8.45. And then from 8.45 to 4.30 is my work day, mm. you know. But I rarely ever come up at 4.30 because there's always something. Of course. Yeah, this, this is urgent, you know. This, that, that, you know, It's always urgent, right? So, you know, one day she said, she's just sick and tired of like, you know, I'm up here, I'm burning out, you know, you got to come up and help out. Like, just because you make money doesn't make it doesn't excuse you from helping out around the house and offering to do other things. Like, right. so I take out the dishes, I do the uh, or I clean the dishes, take out the garbages. You know, I'm, I shut my day down. I try to shut it down from four thirty to eight thirty and be present for the family. And she pretty much said this. I said, I threw back something like, um, "I'm working hard for us. You know, you couldn't appreciate all this if it wasn't for how hard I work." She says, Vince. You were working just as hard before I met you. <laughs> yeah. You would be working just as many hours if we weren't in this relationship. Don't tell me you're doing this for us. Mm. You're doing this for you. You're doing this to build up Vince Del Monte. You're not doing this. For, I'm kind of now pulling it up, but she yeah. made her point. And she's right. I was, you know, and I'm like, what my identity is still wrapped in being the successful entrepreneur, the successful business guy, whatever. And, um, why is that so important to you? Are you chasing something? Or is it to feel an insecurity? Do you feel like that's your value? 
Yeah, yeah, big time. And, and, and fear of losing that. The fear of losing that. It's not to... Does it stem back to childhood? Where did it come from? I think because I found this... I just found this new sense of identity in something that I, you know, that wasn't like kind of laid out for me. Like nobody in my family... Uh, my grandpa's an entrepreneur, but like nobody in my world, like I came from an old school Italian background, you know, my parents aren't like this bad, but I used to date a girl where, you know, they wouldn't put her in swimming lessons because they were afraid she would drown. Yeah. Oh, you, Jesus that kind Christ, of, we that got a lot kind, in common. That kind of fear, right? So, you know, I was always Did your told, mom do everything for you? Make your bed, make your food, clean your room, that kind of shit? It's true. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, um, I was also, um, my parents definitely put a lot of protection on it. I feel like it was, to be honest, a good thing because kids are stupid. I was, you know, teenagers are, you know, idiots. Like we need to be protected. A little bit, yeah. uh, so, so like you don't have to learn the hard way all the time, maybe some of the time. So um, I'm not exactly sure where it came from. I think it was, if it was something that felt like my own, you know, as a runner, I found my identity in running, but as a mid packer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, your, is your brother older or younger than you? A younger and an older. Sorry, sorry. I have uh, two younger brothers. Two younger brothers. Sorry. Did you feel a responsibility to be the 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 leader to show them that you're successful, or was one of your younger brothers maybe more successful than you, faster? Or yeah, what? the drive for the drive yeah. for success is really interesting to me because yeah. coming from a uh, like a Christian home, you know, sometimes uh, money can be the root of all right. evilness. And so we, we kind of hear that growing up. And so it, I'm always interested to see somebody who has a lot of drive and passion work wh- where it came from. I think I just, it, it's interesting. I think it was um, an identity thing. You know, I hadn't really figured out what my identity was. I was, you know, I think like most people in high school, they find their identity in their grades mm-hmm. or being the cool club or being, um, you know, popular or, you know, wh- whatever their- um, Were their you sense. very popular in high school? Yeah. I was skinny Vinny back then. I, I was. I oh, definitely yeah. wasn't a part of the. So cool you're club. nerdier like Sal was. Sal was kind of didn't have yeah, a lot of friends. I, I, had a, I had my best friend was Frank. You know, I mean, Frank walked the halls together, and we and we thought we were the best looking guys in school because our moms told us that we were the best looking guys. <laughs> <laughs> and we truly did. You know, we truly both. I remember when he got his heart broken by a girl that he dated, and uh, he quickly realized. And then, uh, you know, I got turned down by a girl younger than me. You know, she had to go home at twelve o'clock. Uh, on prom night and everybody else got to stay out later and I was like what what the heck and we quickly realized that we weren't the best looking guys in high school <laughs> and, uh, mom you mom, lied, you lied uh, to me bro yeah. so uh, this is a tie in moms bro you know, and then I the, know this. the running was obviously um, you know that kind of filled a big void for me that uh, was coming from being skinny Vinny being known as this weak scrawny pushover and it gave me a sense of like oh yeah Vince is a good runner though I was competitive in triathlon and running so after university, I didn't have the running because I, you know, retired from running. So I think it was just kind of a quest to try and find a new identity. And then I kind of stumbled onto something I was good. Do you think it could have had something to do with the the want to be popular? I mean, I think a lot of people that go through high school would be lying to say that they didn't want to be popular while they were in high school. And then all of a sudden you find this YouTube and internet and you find Dude, out- Dude, man, you guys are asking some incredible questions, by the way. Um, no, I think you're right. It's funny because, um, and it almost ties into like this whole new thing now where I have a problem with eating out. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen my Insta story, but we eat out all the time. And mm. when I eat out, I just eat everything. Like I've got no limitations. I can't, okay, we were at an Italian restaurant last night. I've done it the last three nights where, you know, I have to get a beer, then I got to get a appetizer. I've got to get a main course, you know, Piatti, uh, yeah, secondi, creamy, yeah. secondi. <laughs> and I got to get the dessert. And I'm like, and then I always blow my diet. I'm like so good during the day. I got these limits on what I do and I don't do. I'm so good with my training. But then I just blow my diet at night. And I was talking to my brother. I'm like, and my my parents and my uh, both my brothers, and we're trying to figure out where did this come from? And my, my middle brother, Adrian, remembers that he said, as soon as you started making money, you started going crazy on your diet. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I remember. We go to restaurants and you start bragging about not having to look at the prices on the menu. And something back in my mid-20s uh, must have triggered this habit where now this ability to order anything on the menu has now led to this habit where I have a hard time not going berserk on the menu. Like I'll literally, like last night, heck, two nights ago we went out and we had three take-homes before the main courses came. (laughs) We already had three take-homes before the main course had come. Like, so why am I ordering all this food? 
Mm. I can identify with that. So yeah. I have a very similar story, but it wasn't just food. It's in all aspects. I tend to overindulge, but a lot of that was because I didn't have a lot growing up. So and all money, the restrictions money, that you yeah, had right. Money it. was the root of all evilness yeah. when I was growing up. We didn't have a lot of it. You know, we were evicted from. I lived, I lived in seven different homes growing up, and then uh, by the time I was twenty-one years old, I'd already bought my house. And so I, I had found money at a very early age, and it wasn't all evil for me. It was actually gave me opportunity. I could go to a restaurant and have a seventy-dollar steak and not worry about it. Mm. And so I think for a lot of my twenties. I overindulged on everything I got into. And for me, that's why it was because I know that I didn't have a lot. And so that was something now in my 30s, I've learned to find balance, uh, more balance in my life. That's what made me really interested in the, the drive for success and money and po- possibly popularity for you if it was, you know, maybe because you felt like you wanted a lot of it when you're younger, then now you're starting to experience some of it. I can add something to this. So the drive, where where the drive came from, I think it did come from trying to find a new identity. But what's really interesting now is where the drive comes from now. Like you guys are already successful, no? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, but why are you still driven? Like really, like, and it's an interesting conversation because I had someone ask this question to me. Like, are you actually trying to go? Everyone says, what does everyone say? Got to go to the next level. You got to go to the next level. Well, are you really trying to go to the next level? Are you trying to prevent going down to the last level? Are you actually making your decisions based on growth or are you making your decisions based on maybe if we did make that decision, it could fail and we'll lose what we have. So why don't we play the safe decision? Are you playing to win or are you playing not to lose? Yes. Yes. Prevent defense. That's it. And and that's, I think, the more interesting conversation because I'm finding a lot of guys these days and I can relate because this has been me for the last few years until I got reconnected with two coaches this past summer who helped me identify that, um, you know, a business has plateaued, it plateaued for almost four years straight, like at a great level, but it hasn't grown for four years straight because I'm making all my decisions out of fear. Because mm. what if I lose this? Now so I've, for four years, you were kind of at a plateau? Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Now, did did that kind of fuck with you at all? Or were you actually at a point too where, hey, I'm making good money, I'm kind of enjoying my money and doing things Until like that? Until it started to go backwards. Oh, okay. Until it started to go backwards. What so was that moment like? Um, well, I realized, you know, it was like, this was happening all along, like this slow leak that I wasn't aware of. And I, there's a couple of pieces to it. You know, one, you can stop. It really is. There is truth to say that you can lose the hunger. Like if you, if you're not hungry anymore, Mm -hmm. you can plateau, get comfortable. Uh, there was, there was a number of pieces. There was a lot of red, shiny objects, chasing a lot of different things at once, spreading myself thin. Um, I didn't have any coaches looking over my shoulders in those years. Um, I was really big on doing a lot of affiliate promotions. A lot of my income was from promoting other people's products. I had a couple partnerships. Um, my wife's business was like in full swing, making a lot of money as well. And I realized like I didn't have a real business. I had a promotional based business. It was just based on the next offer, the next offer, which was which is what I was good at, but it's pretty much like a job. I had to show up at work. I had to put out a promotion just like every everyone else has to show up at work. Mm. And um I realized that this, I'm not going to be in business in 2020. I remember hearing Gary V say something like, are you, are, is your business operating right now based on how others' businesses will be thriving in 2020? I'm like, I'm in a sinking ship right now. Mm. This is going backwards. And I was, I got to a point where I was a very, very rich, broke man. Mm. A lot was coming in, but a lot was going out, trying to you know make something work and nothing was working. And that's when I was like, I saw my revenue one year and it was like, this has been my lowest year. And then I went back a little bit more. I'm like, what the heck's going on here? Did you feel that affect you as a person? Like, did it affect your personal relationship with your wife and your kids and your friends? Like, did you notice that uh, it, it had a cause? Yeah, of, I would uh, work more. Uh, yeah, I remember this was, this was like in the first couple of years, you know, we were married. And this was actually, it was around the time where my daughter was born. And yeah, where she needed me the most here, I'm like, you know, trying to keep this thing afloat, keeping this thing growing. So yeah, it was happening in those like first, uh, not first, second, third, I think it was like the third to sixth year of marriage. Yeah. So it definitely doesn't help because now you're focused on this business and you're not, now you're neglecting her needs, her need for um, intimacy, for order in the home and for financial security, which are the three things every woman needs. Don't blame her. It's how God wired her. Mm. And she wasn't getting those things. 
So um, yeah, that creates, there's a whole new layer of stress. You talk about, you talked about her and you having your best relationship now after all the years you guys have been through, what do you think was the most challenging time in your marriage and what, why? The most challenging time, um, it definitely was those, those years where it was just all about me, me, me still. It was just like trying to just neglecting her needs. Um, lose like I remember one time she said, um, "I don't even feel like we're friends. Mm. We're married, but I don't even feel like we have a friendship anymore." And I'm like, "What the heck? Mm. Um, that's intense!" Like so, so I, I was like, "We don't even have a friendship." I'm like I feel like everything's fine, and that was the worst part because the dude typically thinks everything is fine. Mm -hmm. and, and good women, like they don't, you know, some of them like you could call them a push or, or you know, not. Um, maybe being a pushover. Some of them just don't want to create drama, but every woman has a tolerance level. And if she doesn't feel valued, pretty soon she's going to kick your sorry ass to the curb and go find somebody who does make her, does make you feel valued and doesn't make, does make her feel valued. And, um, yeah, so that was, uh, it, I, I wouldn't say there was like one event, but it was, it was one of those things that it was like, it's just like that complacency where you're just like you're like yeah it's not a big deal not a big deal not a big deal but it, it's these little deals like you know one percent a day adds up over seven years right and then if you've got four or five things they're tolerating times one percent over five seven years like then that's how you know it's it's tough right it all adds up one day and the next thing you know they can't they explode they snap was that a devastating you know? thing to hear from her what would you do right after that thankfully like Thankfully, I'm, you know, I grew up in a home where like, you know, my parents have like really taught me a lot about like, you've got to invest in this, Vince, you got to invest in this. Like you think you guys came out the way you did by chance, you know, and you've got to work on it. You've got to put the work in, like building your body. And I just realized I wasn't putting the work in and I realized I can put the work in and I just have to stop finding my identity in this online business and this success in this outside world. I have to find my identity as, as a man, who's a father, who's a husband, and, um, and more, and more than just, um, just a fitness guy. And it was actually funny because I was the same time, like the YouTube channel was kind of like, you know, it was going through kind of some rough times because I was just trying to put myself out there as a fitness guy, fitness guy. So I had to really like, evolve, figure out, like rebrand myself almost like figure out like what's my true worth as a person. Is it like just being a fitness guy? Um, no, I've, I've got more to offer, not just the world, but to this woman. And, and that was probably like the hard part about. Um, slowing the pace down. I think like just saying, cause I was comparing myself to all these guys who've like their businesses are exploding, but I also knew some stuff going on in their personal life that I wouldn't personally want for my own. And they're just because that was, they were finding their self-worth and their net worth. And I was going down that path. So it was leaking into my relationship to try and keep up with these guys, mm. but their values weren't the same as mine. Like they weren't really trying to be family guys. Like they were just focused on their deal. So, did you so what have you implemented now to? Well, that's what I was just going to ask. I was going to yeah, ask help with the habits or rituals that you've created to combat that. Because I know you know a lot of times when we're guys like this, you know, sure you you become aware of it. That's the first step. But then we still have this tendency to go back. So, have you put some things in place uh, to counter that? Yeah, I mean this this, this schedule with like it's taking me like two years to get to the point where I do take weekends off. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm on my phone here. I got my phone on and I'm checking things here and there, but like, I'm not sitting down at my laptop to do real work. Mm -hmm. So taking weekends off has been huge and shutting my day down at four 30. And you know, if it's five o'clock, I'm still shutting my day down to be present with the family. Mm -hmm. So the putting limits, so putting limits on myself helped, has helped a lot. Um, and then, uh, you know, Getting back to church, I'll be honest, was the biggest thing going back to an amazing place in Toronto called Eleva Elevation. Elevation Church, the pastor's outstanding, Stephen Furtick. Um, he's written like five books, got a beautiful family. The guy's built too. He's like, mm. takes care of himself, 20,000 people. Um, this church is amazing, like outstanding. And this guy's 37 years old. And, you know, I'm just, he just turned 38. And I just watching the impact that this guy's having, I'm like, dude, I got to smarten up. Like, I got to get my walk back in order. And uh, I can have so much bigger impact if I just get on the path that I know that I'm supposed to be on. So just going there every Sunday helped out a lot. And um, and then, you know, obviously my wife, wife started reading some stuff too that helped with just like how to fight well, how to have arguments, 
um, in a way that, you know, you, you don't start slipping in the low blows that are like, crap, did we just say that to each other? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's trying to learning how to dance with each other right. and, um, you know, just really just working on it and, and just trying to live in a home where we um, extend grace and try to just keep reminding ourselves, like we're on the same team. We, we need to work as a unit here. Like this isn't working out um, us like on each it's other. It's tough when you don't, it's very, very difficult when you you're chasing something uh, of an, of an identity because of feeling an insecurity or a fear of if I don't have this, then who am I? Because if you're doing that, the relation, the relationships you have can become based on that and they can mm. feel not secure or false, or you can just not have a good concept of what this relationship is based on because you're constantly chasing something else. Like what is your identity without your business? Like, have you found that? Yeah. I feel like I'm getting closer to it. I, I feel like I'm really close to uh, representing a, a man that is in a fight and you recognize that life is a fight. I, I think what a lot of men are connecting to me on is that I'm recognizing the fights that matter most. Like there's certain fights that us men, we need to win. Mm. And if we don't win. Which ones are they? Anger, mm. lust, pride, complacency. Like those are things that men struggle with. That if you don't get around other men who are fighting these same fights, man, you're done. Which and ones are the biggest challenges for you? I think um, definitely pride. Mm. You know, pride's a big one. It's that Italian thing. Um, just, you just you know, that like pride, us. that ego, I think that's always a struggle to just want to, you know, that, you know, str- and even that, uh, you know, quest for power mm. to be known as somebody who's powerful or who's successful. So I think that's, well, especially if you, like you said, you, if you were in, in high school and you felt like you didn't have that and you felt inadequate, you could live now the rest of your life chasing that feeling that you felt like you didn't have and mm. end up in a place that's. Uh, not benefiting you at all. Um, and you're starting to identify that now. What would yeah. you say are some of the, the positive things and then some of the negative things of growing up in a home where your father's a pastor? The bar was set high, but I, looking back, I'm glad he set it high. I, I used to, I'm kind of a weird anomaly. I used to tell my parents, you guys need to fight more because this isn't like, is, is this actually attainable? <laughs> and we never saw the work that went under, you know, went into the relationship behind the table. Like that's, they really worked on the relationship and had other people in their lives mentoring them in the whole marriage department. Mm-hmm. Like how many people have a marriage coach? And, and um, you know, a lot of people think that marriage um, counseling is like for one year, relationship is into trouble. No, when your relationship's in trouble, it's too late. You need to be in marriage counseling from day one. Mm. Who doesn't need help? Like just the concept of marriage is, is insane. Mm. Two people together the rest of their life. Like it's almost, you have to almost like come in at like a kind of a bit of a, like, what are we getting ourselves into here? Mm. Yeah, you, <laughs> Like you're surprised you're getting into a argument right now. Like, right. of course you're going to get into it. Right. So, um, so I think that was a big one. Like seeing um, my dad set the bar high, watching my, father love my mom um and seem like that's ultimately the best way a father can show his kids that he loves them the best way you can show your kids how you love them is how you love the mother and um and that's that's really um powerful because you see what a real man is you know how he respects her and and that was really powerful and then to just to, you know, grow up with, uh, you know, a set of rules. Like there are things that are right in life and there are things that are wrong. Yeah. And I always struggle for, with that. I don't ever know. I don't, ever know, I don't know where it came from, but I always like my brothers will laugh at me. Like Vince is always in the gray. He's kind of always like, <laughs> he's always kind of like conniving. He's kind of a little sneaky. My brothers, my other two brothers aren't like that. It's like black and white, you know, mm-hmm. exactly where they stand. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of like, well, I guess we could do that. But um, <laughs> so understanding there's a right and wrong. And um, I think one of the best things my parents taught me is to be highly engaged in their kids' lives. Mm-hmm. Like to this day, my parents are so, so engaged. It's it's almost like a little too much. Um, and uh, to be engaged with the kids and, and to realize the kids, if you want to raise adults, you have to spend a tremendous, tremendous amount of time with them. And that's, I think, the hardest thing that I think entrepreneurs wrestle with because time is like your precious commodity. And to spend time with a child, it's like, now you're now 
you can't, you don't see the immediate return, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're like trusting like the time you're putting in with the kids is going to pay off down the road. Like, but you're not seeing an ROI from sitting on the floor right. and putting dinosaur puzzles together for 15 <laughs> minutes mm -hmm. or doing, you know, call it reading Pinkalicious for, uh, <laughs> for 15 minutes because there's no R immediate ROI for the business guy. What's a, what's one thing that you have vowed to do differently than your parents? Man, oh man, where are you getting these questions? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to let them learn the hard way a little sooner. I think I'm going to let them, uh, I definitely think I could have learned some lessons earlier on. They did protect me. I think it was probably good for the most part. Like you were a bit sheltered? Is that what you Yeah, mean? yeah. A little shelter. I was sheltered for quite a while. Um, you want to make your kids strong. You don't want to necessarily, you know, shelter them. I but, might try and have- That's something I learned too. Yeah. I probably try not to be as fearful and realize that I'm not, you know, these kids don't just have uh, an earthly father, but they have a heavenly, heavenly father as well who's looking after them. And who's got a bigger plan for them than I do is their earthly father. And those kids were put here for a bigger purpose than just me, um, you know, raising them. Like there's another guy who's also got reins on this kid. So like, I don't have to be terrified about like, you know, there can be mistakes and they can, you know, get miss, miss, they can get back on track, you know? So probably not be, probably try not to be as fe fear-based mm. and try to be as protective Wow. Do you, uh, because you're pretty open about your faith and you talk about it quite a bit. Uh, do you find the people in our industry um, receive it well? Receive it well or poorly? I know nowadays it's a, it's interesting. Like you, you'll have people who are supportive and you have other people roll their eyes and don't want to hear it, you know? And, and, and you know what? It's crazy. I was talking about this uh, the other day. Um, it's almost all positive. <laughs> Because the only people, I find like the sooner people can figure out what you stand for, the quicker they can figure out if they want to hang out with you. So right. it's better off to lead with that. Like we were talking before, like just lead with the biggest elephant in the room because at least now you know where, who I am. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So if people are like, oh, he's one of these guys. Well, at least I don't waste their time. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, interesting. I'll give them some time. And uh, I don't really, I think is only helped because I only attract the kinds of people that I want to hang out with and that uh, they might want to hang out with. And we have, you know, that commonality, they kind of know where I came from. So I figure the sooner um, they know what I'm all about, the more I also can give credit to where like a lot of the source of my strength comes from, right? And where the source of my standards come from. So um, it was something that I didn't talk about as much like one, you know, I kind of planted some seeds in some of my books and some of my programs. And a lot of people would email me and say, are you a Christian? I'm like, you know, I would never reply back because I never led with that. But if you watch my Insta stories, you know, it's pretty clear um, where I stand. And um, it's never been an issue because mm -hmm. I think people, like I've got friends of different faith and different uh, beliefs and stuff. And we're still friends. Um, we don't typically don't like talk about it much at all or whatever, but we're still friends. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I think it's, what's the big deal? Well, you know, talking about friends, uh, you know, I just got interviewed recently and we got into this like, you know, big game changers for you as, as a young teenage boy going into adulthood that you put together. One of the things that I had shared was big for me was realizing how much the people I spend the most time with influence who I am. So you're, you're five people that you spend the most mm -hmm. time with. And learning how to grow beyond some of those people and recognizing that, you know, oh, we were probably really good friends when we were in our, you know, 15, 16, because we we're all into sports and we were competitive. And so that kind of drove us when we were young. And now we're into young adulthood and I'm recognizing like, oh shit, these guys want me to do well, but not better than them because hmm. they're so competitive. And that's not the people I want uh, mm -hmm. around me all the time, even though we go way back and I need to be seeking people that feed Who are your my true fans. Right. Yeah. Who's really feeding your flame. Mm -hmm. So did, you know, did you put that together and, you know, do you, do you still have relationships like that or have you learned to kind of grow beyond and move beyond those people that are unhealthy in your life? You know, it's interesting. I, I, I feel like I've just been so blessed over the years. I don't know if it's because my parents prayed for me every morning and still do to this day, like for 15, 30 minutes every single day, they pray for me and my brothers. And, um, I, I've really been blessed with a lot of good people in my life. Um, one of my best friends, I still remember like whenever I told him about my numbers, like when I started having the online success, he was so, so, so happy. 
he's an Italian guy, mm-hmm. Joe Costa. He's a, a Sicilian guy too. Okay. And he would pick me up and lift me up. He's like, that's amazing. And he's a successful surgeon now and that. And I think it's just uh, comes, and he just came from a family of Italians too. Just they, He grew up in a loving, loving home. And I think uh, maybe it comes from like kids that were raised in really, really loving homes. They just like don't have that fear. Um, they're not as scared of like, what if something bad happens? Like, well, mom and dad still love me. Mm-hmm. So um, for the most part, um, I've attracted really, I've met really good people. Um, I, I've got a couple like situations where like, like the relationships should have been cut off a lot earlier, but I, I can't say that I've really been in toxic relationships yeah. that were really like, I, ta- I was taught really early, like if you're dating a girl, you know, first of all, you shouldn't be, um, shopping if you don't plan to buy, mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? And uh, you know, when you're test driving the car, a test drive isn't you know, ten years. It's like you know, you test drive the car. It's a couple of days. You know, <laughs> you're gonna get a pretty good feel. So I um, kind of realized like you can kind of figure someone out pretty early. So like if you got a bad vibe early on, you know, you can kind of trust that instinct. Mm. So like try not to like pursue that. You ever get your heart broken? Well, yeah, I don't know if it was like, I definitely had my heart broken. I remember telling my mom, I've, uh, you know, when I was 16, when I was 22, yeah, these girls both told me uh, when I thought it was like we were getting married. I can't tell you how many times I told my mom I found the one. <laughs> oh, oh no. shit. Oh, yeah, I was that guy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, oh, yeah, she just, yeah. It's not me, it's you, but yeah, oh, many times, many times. I remember an Italian girl that broke up with me, um, she told me that I was too, too ambitious. Like she told me I need to relax. Like, why does everything have to be about like doing something? Why can't we just sit here? And like, I, I realized that's when I was the weird one and that she wasn't the weird one. She's like, why do we always have to talk about what we're going to do? Why do we always, she, I remember what she said. Why do we always have to talk about our goals? <laughs> why do we always have to talk about what we're going to do with our life? And I'm like, huh, that's a good question. It's all we do talk about, isn't it? Um, so yeah, I've had my heart broken. Hmm. What do you, what do you fear for your kids the most? You got little ones, and the world is a lot different today than it was when we were. Holy mackerel. You know, just that uh, I think the hardest thing to give kids these days is, you know, what Dr. Meg Meeker calls moral courage, to have courage to stand up for what's right and wrong. You know, I don't know. I didn't. I haven't listened too much about the, the latest shooting, but, you know, from what I understand, um, a lot of people saw this kind of leading up with this kid uh, who did the shooting and uh, nobody said anything because they were afraid they might be labeling him of some mm-hmm. sort. Like, I don't want my kids to be afraid to stand up for what's right and wrong. And the only way for the kids to do that is for them to see mom and dad. So I think the biggest thing is like, I don't, is that I man up when I need to man up. If situations arise that I'm like, this some, this isn't right. I got to actually say something here. I can't just swipe this one under the rug too. Cause I'm a non-confrontational guy for the most part. I do my best to avoid confrontations, um, but to ensure like I don't avoid the confrontations that I need to for the sake of my kids seeing an example of moral courage. Mm. You have uh, boys, girls, a daughter and a son, daughter and a son. And then you got one on the way. Um, what about technology? What about with your kids and technology? How do you, how do you feel about all that? I mean, they're definitely not going to kids houses. Um, that have available internet ac- internet access um, with without parents there for the reason. Oh of- shit, that's a hard one to try and police. Yeah, man, way. good luck on that. That's yeah. tough. Well, because the porn, right? Oh yeah, man, it's so easily accessible. I I got a killer podcast with a, a, a guy that wrote a book called Surfing for God, and he's writing a new book called Better Than Porn. And uh, this is actually a topic I'm really interested in. And um, we discuss this a lot. Do yeah? Oh yeah, because just look what look what's going on with ED. Yeah, yeah, erectile dysfunction and, and yeah. men in their twenties exploding. Yeah, when that was never the case. I think that's one of the biggest things for um, you know, to protect my kids from things that can be avoided. So just really like, is this what's going to be tough? This is going to be the hardest thing because like I got like a lot of great friends and guys I love, respect, and all that, but I don't know if we have the same beliefs in to the point where. This is going to be hard to say, but like, I don't know if I'd want their son dating my daughter mm-hmm. based on knowing who they are. It's so crazy because that's that's I'll sum it up like that. Well, when you say that, it, it kind of leans towards your 
the thing that you're most concerned about is sheltering your kids too much. Isn't that funny when you think about that? When you think about the thing that you're mm-hmm. most concerned with, I want to actually right yeah. as soon as we start to point somewhere where huh. oh shit, this could be a challenge for me. The first thing that you want to do is go and protect them. It's crazy. And huh. maybe maybe that maybe there's more 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 there, right? Like maybe there's more there than than doing that. That you know, could you potentially? shelter them the same way that you were just in this era, right? Because we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have that. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the scary thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe you have to have a little more faith in the way you are as a father and a leader that, you know what, my kid will make the right decision. Sure, yeah. I'll have the opportunity there to do that. I can't police that or control it's that. It's impossible. It's impossible unless you lock them up in a room and then, you know, what kind of a, what kind of a child is, is that going to turn into? What kind of an adult is that going to turn into? You know, it's, yeah. I, I have a 12 year old, right? Mm-hmm. My, my son's 12. And so what I've done with my, with my son, cause my daughter's eight. So we're not really having these conversations yet, but what I've done with my son is I've just made a policy of brutal honesty. Mm. So when we have a conversation about drugs mm. and he asked me, you know, you know, he goes, Papa, why do people do, you know, these drugs? And I said, well, because they feel good. You know, I'm being honest with them. Like, you know, I remember the shit that I was told, which was. <laughs> A lie, you know. Oh, they're crazy. These are crazy people, and they're yeah. They then, jump. They jump off trains and then you're buildings. A, and then you're a kid, especially if you're. A, I was a very precocious child, and I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a habitual line crosser. Like if there's a line, I'm gonna put my foot on the other side just to see what's going on. And so you know, if if my kid's anything like I was, and he hears from me, oh, it's all you know, people are crazy, and then he tries, and he's like, whoa, I like this. Like I like drinking a little bit. This feels like fun. Everything else I told him was was bullshit. So I'm going to be honest with him. I'm going to say, look, a lot of people do it because they like it. But here's what happens as a result of that sometimes. And the vast majority of people that do these things don't become addicts, but sometimes people do because of this. And then we talked about pornography. And mm. why do why do people want to look at you know pornography? And I'll tell them, well, because you're stimulated visually and this is what happens. And the male brain is attracted to novelty. Mm. But here's what happens when you look at pictures after picture, video after video, it restructures your brain. Yep. And, then you, and so I, I'm, I'm just brutally honest and I'm going to be the exact same way to my daughter, which I think will be more difficult for me because I got that little bit of that stereotype going on. But, uh, but yeah, man, cause I was, I think me, I think you and I grew up very similar, uh, very sheltered. Um, I'm probably a little more rebellious than you from hearing your stories. Um, I do tend to test things out, but you know, I think if my parents were honest with me or not afraid, like mm. like sex was taboo. Like we didn't talk about sex. Interesting. Ever. Yeah. Um, I learned about sex because I'd go to work with my dad. My dad was in construction and his, co- his, his workers would tell me dirty jokes. Mm. And that's when I learned about sex was through that. And I found a dirty magazine once and then that was you know how I found out some other mm-hmm. stuff. So it's that brutal honesty, man. Mm-hmm. That's it. But you, you got young kids, right? How old are they? Yeah, four and two. Yeah. You know, I, th- I think the biggest thing is um, just to be highly engaged. I think my greatest fear is like, well, I will I be willing to give them the time they need? Because I think, you know, how do kids spell love, right? T-I-M-E. <laughs> it, it's just time, you know, 15 minutes with them. On- my mom told me something great the other day. She goes, just get down on your hands and knees on the carpet and play with Melia 15 minutes a day. And, and, and I'm like, it's so simple. It's like, you know, I'm going to be two, three, four hours, 15 minutes a day, get down on your hands and knees without your phone and just be present. Just be present. And it's amazing how much better the kids act. Right. It's oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, they just want your attention at the end of the day. And like you said, that's definitely a, a sign of love that you can show them just by doing simple things like yeah. that. Yeah. A great book. I got to mention this written by Meg Meeker. It's called Hero. And she's like, absolutely outstanding. She's got a podcast specifically for parents. Mm. It's our go-to. And she talks a lot about how what a, a daughter's doing with the dad in her early days, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, but she's when she's acting out, when she's trying to get your attention, what she's primarily like acting out, doing things like, why is she doing this? Like she's not supposed to be doing, she wasn't raised to do this. She's trying to see if you're strong enough to protect her. It's a test. She's testing you. And so when she's throwing her arms up and she's going crazy, that's not, you don't teach her how to conduct self-control by coming in and freaking out too. You come in with silent strength Mm. and you come in and you just come in firm and you come in as that hero. You come in as that strong person that loves her and teaches her by demonstration. So she knows like daddy can protect me. Daddy's strong. He doesn't freak out when something goes wrong. And um, that's how they... That that father son dyna- that that father daughter dynamic is really really important, and um, so yeah, that's one thing I'm really trying to do a lot with her, just like giving her the time 
to just do the things that she wants to do, coloring in her coloring book. <laughs> um, and just another big thing I, I, you know, really try to do with her a lot is to validate her character and not her beauty. Is she beautiful? Yes. But the worst thing you can do for a girl when she's young is to say how beautiful she is because then she finds her identity in her beauty. And then when she's in her teens and she looks at herself in the mirror and she's going through puberty and she's getting pimples, she's like, daddy, you're lying to me. I'm not pretty. I'm not beautiful. Mm -hmm. So if she finds her identity in her beauty, then what does she do when she goes into high school? She goes to find the guys, the girls that find their identity and their beauty. So I really try and compliment her as much as possible in terms of uh, why she's special. And she's special because there's nobody else like her in the world. And to compliment, hey, I like how you treated John Luca today and how you shared with them. I liked how you asked that person um, if you could pet their dog before going up to pet their dog. So I'm complimenting her character, which is something she can control. Girls can't control their beauty, especially when they start going through hormone crap. Mm -hmm. So um, really trying to help her find her identity. And if, you know, my son as well, he's little, he's only two, but to help her find her identity in who she is as opposed to how she looks. Good deal, brother. Perfect. What are, you, what are you looking at in the future for your business? And wh what do we got in the future for you? Right now, I'm focused on helping um, 75 men take their online business to the next level. I've mm. got 50 guys in my 12-month coaching program. Have you developed any stars yet or is this yes. relatively new? <laughs> Dude, yeah, I've got a lot. I mean, I developed a nickname because I was one of the first guys that got into the industry. People call me the OG. So back in 2010, I've helped like literally dozens of guys build six and seven figure online businesses. And I do have a number of success stories. We actually just uploaded one to YouTube. Uh, his name is Jordan Valeria. And I helped him go over, uh, he did, he's done over half a million dollars in under two years in a market that I know nothing about. He teaches guys how to mix music. And, and I went over and I interviewed him and his wife. And, um, you know, I've got literally... Um, dozens of guys I'm working with who have doubled, tripled their list sizes, their, their revenues, who've you know transformed their life. One guy, um, Align, he um, is renewing his wedding vows, I think this month or next month, because when he got married to his uh, wife, he couldn't even afford a $200 wedding ring. And since we started working together, he's quadrupled his online income and he's throwing her the wedding of her dreams in Orlando, Florida. So, uh, it, you know, like stories like that, you know, another fellow, uh, Joe uh, Legalbo, he came out to my event two years ago. He was literally dead broke. He's working a dead end job. He had $2,000 to his name. And um, his wife actually supported him to use the final $2,000. He was scared to come to my two-day seminar. He came to my two-day seminar and now, you know, he's a multi-six-figure earner. And, um, and he's another success story. And, and it's, it's really cool because a lot of the guys that are in my group are like, you know, recently married or in a relationship and they're just basically taking the same path that I took many, many years ago. And, uh, they're not chasing their, yes, we're going to make the money. Mm -hmm. They want to make the money. That's why they can give me the money because they're going to make it back. But what's really, really exciting me exciting me the most is like the caliber of guys coming into the group. And when guys tell me I was at so-and-so's mastermind and it's just all about the money. And yes, we teach the tactics. We teach the strategy. We give everyone their marching orders on how to execute before their next event. But these guys are like the guys you've brought into this room. Like these are some really good quality men in these room, in the room. Like, you know, guys like you guys who are like trying to do more than just like going for the quick grab. And, and these guys are forming real, real relationships and they see substance in the room and they're really just realizing like being a part of this group is an opportunity to unlock their potential and they're not going to be able to do it on their own. So um, that's what's getting me really excited. Um, guys realizing that I'm, I'm, you know, they're going to probably stay in the group, not just for that, but because the relationships they formed and the growth they're experiencing. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to set the bar high for these guys too, in terms of like, Hey, I want I don't want you guys to kick your family to the curb in terms of uh, it, to build this online business. Let's it's not like if we do it, it's how we do it. Mm. And it's not if we do it, but it's who you become in the process. It's like, "Oh, you built your a great body, but yeah, you, you cheated the whole time." Right. Uh, you know, or you have a shitty personality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, "Oh, you built a great big business, but you did it selling, you know, overnight weight loss." Like mm -hmm. making money is easy. Building right. your body is easy. The question is, is who you become and how you do it. Mm. And so I'm trying to get them to think bigger. And this is all because I've got guys doing that for me as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. I'm, Excellent. Well, I'm glad we finally got connected, man. I'm, we've yeah. been trying to get connected for some time and I'm for sure we're, we will stay in touch a lot. And this will not be the last time that we hop on each other's podcast, man. I'm really excited to see 
where you go from here. We'd love to have Thanks, you up man. in uh, in California in our in our facility. Do some more content. And I was as I was saying, I think I mentioned to Sal, but not to Justin and Adam before we started. My next uh, mastermind is May twelfth and thirteenth. You guys are welcome to come as my guests. Cool. I'm sure the guys would love to hear Let's from talk you. About it. Excellent. And uh, if the yeah dates are available. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, Appreciate it. Happen, man. Thanks, yeah. brother. Right on. All right. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>